The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's technical session. Today's session is uh, sponsored by ACI 225 Hydraulic Cement Committee. Uh, the session is Portland Limestone Cements, a technology to improve the sustainability of concrete. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, and that is Paul Tennis. And Paul is the uh, Manager of Products, Standards, and Technology for the Portland Cement Association. And Paul is going to present to us today on the specification requirements and environmental performance of Portland limestone cements. Well, good morning. I'm glad I'm uh, honored to lead off the session today uh, on Portland limestone cements. And I'll start with a basic definition to make sure we're all on the same page. Portland limestone cements are a relatively new cement type to the U.S. Uh, that contain between 5 and 15 percent limestone, uh, 5 to 15 percent by mass. Uh, we'll talk in detail today about the specification requirements and the environmental benefits uh, from using Portland limestone cements. Uh, I've got a slide uh, on some of the uh, mechanisms by which limestone contributes to the properties of cement and concrete. And then the reason we went through the exercise of establishing the requirements and the specifications for Portland limestone cements is essentially to provide another tool to make concrete even more sustainable, uh, while, of course, maintaining the performance we've come to expect out of concrete. Now, last summer, ASTM and uh, AASHTO uh, revised their blended cement specifications, C595 and M240, uh, and this was a significant accomplishment for a joint uh, AASHTO-ASTM harmonization task group that's been looking at the cement specifications and trying to uh, come up with improvements to both of them to minimize the differences. So the Portland cement specifications are now uh, essentially identical uh, and the blended cement chain, uh, specifications are as well. And the recent changes last fall to include definitions for Portland limestone cement uh, are also identical. Now the approach that was taken by the joint task group was to review the European specifications, uh, European experience. Uh, they've got several decades of experience in using Portland limestone cements. Um, and then we look for ways to ad uh, adopt and interpret those requirements in the U.S. specifications. And the approach taken was to use the same physical requirements as the previously existing blended cement types. So the Type 1S, the Portland Blast Furnace Slag Cement, the Type 1P, Portland Poslin Cement, use the same physical requirements. Um, we also use very similar chemical requirements, and we'll talk about in details. We did bump up the LOI. Um, there are currently no provisions for uh, Portland Limestone Cements to be considered moderate or highly sulfate resistant. Uh, there's research uh, ongoing on this topic, and I anticipate that will change in the future. Um, but for now, uh, there are no uh, MS or HS designations for PLCs. And then one of the other changes we made is we included some requirements on limestone when it is used as an ingredient in a blended cement. So I'll cover all those as we go. So this is table three of uh, C595 and, and M240. Whoops, I think I went too far. I think I lost a couple of slides. Anyway, this is uh, actually table two, I believe, uh, chemical requirements for blended cement. 
And what I've got here is in black are the requirements for the uh, other blended cement types, the ones that have been around for decades. Uh, the 1S and the 1P. The 1L is the new cement type, 15, 5 to 15% limestone. And then there's also type 1T, ternary cements, and those can contain limestone. And if, and if limestone is, the content of limestone is greater than slag, which is what this uh, L greater than or equal to S indicates, um, then the, provision, the chemical requirements here for the, the type 1L apply. If the pozzolan is greater than the limestone content in a ternary blend, then these chemical requirements apply. Uh, and likewise, if slag is, is the dominant non-Portland cement component in the ternary cement, this uh, first column applies. Um, so you can see, the, again, similar requirements to the previously existing blended cements. Um, we've got a default sulfate maximum content of 3%. Um, which can be exceeded if you uh, can demonstrate improved performance with additional sulfate, and if C1038 data um, indicates that it's safe to do so. And then we also bumped up the loss on ignition. You know, limestone itself loses about half its weight when you ignite it to 950 or 1,000 degrees. Um, and so if we wanted to incorporate 5 to 15% limestone in a blended cement, we had to make allowances for that. So that's uh, the reason that was bumped up. I'm going to um, break out here to see if I can unhide some slides that are missing, which apparently I can't. So my apologies. The slides that are missing basically covered the uh, existing performance requirements, the strength, the setting time, the fineness, um, autoclave expansion, all those requirements are identical to um, what's in there now, what was in there uh, several years ago for type 1S and type 1P. The type 1L cements have to meet those same requirements. Um, heat of hydration, other physical tests, uh, all have to be met in the same, same way. Now, for limestone to be used as an ingredient in a blended cement, uh, we have these requirements, a minimum calcium carbonate content of 70%, um, maximum methylene blue index of 1.2 grams per 100 gram, and total organic carbon content of half a percent. Now these last two requirements are um, believed to be related to freeze-thaw performance of concretes made with using Portland limestone cements. Uh, based on some European data from the early 1990s. Um, when the Joint Astro ASTM Harmonization Task Group was reviewing that data, uh, it was, I'll be polite and I'll say it was less than conclusive. However, these provisions have been in the European specs for some time, and it was thought that as a conservative measure, we would uh, include those requirements in the C595 and M240 as well. There is research ongoing on this topic to try to confirm whether there's a relationship between freestyle resistance to concrete and these two, um, these two parameters. Um, and uh, when that research is complete, I'm sure you'll be hearing more about it, may lead to changes in these requirements in the specifications. And then because these methods were relatively new, uh, we included the protocols for methylene blue and total organic carbon content in the specifications themselves as uh, mandatory annexes. So in summary, uh, the provisions, um, Portland limestone cements are type 1L and type 1T, uh, both contain between uh, 5 and 15 percent limestone, the same physical requirements as uh, traditional blended cements, uh, similar chemical requirements, uh, but no current provisions for sulfate resistance. And then, of course, if you're using limestone in a blended cement, as I mentioned, you have uh, requirements on limestone as an ingredient there as well. Uh, I'll go on a little bit here to talk about environmental benefits. Uh, this is the um, CO2 footprint in kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of cement produced. And this is data that comes from uh, uh, three different plants in Germany uh, from the early 1990s. And the blue bars here represent the emissions, the CO2 emissions from the plant when it was producing uh, uh, Portland cement, 
and you can see here about 0 0.83, 0 0.82, 0 0.85, something in that range. And that same, those same plants transitioned to making the Portland limestone cement, that number dropped down close to about 0.75. So a measurable and significant improvement um, in the, uh, the CO2 footprint. And then knowing what we know about uh, cement production, we can estimate uh, if you're using 10 or 15 percent limestone, we'll get these kind of uh, fuel and electricity reductions, and we'll get significant reductions also in uh, SOX, NOx, uh, and CO2, and uh, other greenhouse gases of interest. Uh, and these values are all per million tons of cement, and when you, mul you can multiply these by 65, 70, 75 million tons uh, per year, uh, um, or I guess uh, that would be assuming that all of the uh, cement produced in the U.S. was Portland limestone cement. Now, cement accounts for about 95% of the uh, CO2 emissions uh, of a ton of, of, of concrete and about 85% of the energy uh, consumed in producing concrete. So when we make changes to improve the environmental uh, attributes of cements, we're directly uh, improving the environmental attributes of, of concrete as well. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, Portland limestone cements really are a, another tool to implement a proven technology, because it's been used for many years in Europe and other places, uh, to obtain desired performance characteristics and improve the sustainability of concrete. Now, limestone works by um, three basic mechanisms. These are all relatively uh, minor impacts, but they all um, interact additively, so they all make small improvements uh, that add up to uh, significant benefits in the performance. One is particle packing, and that is limestone is, is easier to grind than, say, clinker components, and therefore tends to grind finer. And it can fill in the gaps uh, between larger clinker grains, um, and therefore you can get a denser pace and maybe reduce your water demand somewhat in your concrete. Uh, chemically, the very fine limestone particles has a very, have a very high surface area, and therefore they can also act as nucleation sites for the hydration products of the normal cement hydration reactions to uh, precipitate out on. And if they're precipitating out on the limestone away from the clinker, they're not covering up the clinker grains and slowing those reactions down. So you may be able to get a little a more complete reaction out of your remaining clinker. And then finally, limestone is uh, an inert material, relatively inert material. But in a cement system, a small amount of it does chemically react. Um, the thermodynamic calculations I've seen indicate that if you have 10 or 15 percent limestone in your cements, you'll have 2 or 3 percent of that limestone react. I've seen some anecdotal evidence recently that suggests that those, those amounts are, or might be a little higher in practice, but that's still under investigation. We sometimes get this question. Um, why do we limit our uh, specification to a maximum of 15% limestone? And this is some of the data, uh, some typical type data that, that may uh, explain why. On the x-axis here, we have the amount of limestone added. And on the y, we have a relative change, either in porosity in yellow or in compressive strength, uh, measured for uh, a number of uh, specimens. As you add uh, small amounts of limestone, you get an increase in compressive strength and you get a decrease in porosity. Um, and as you continue to add limestone, you get a relative decrease in that increase until, um, in this case, for these materials, about 14 or 15 percent, you get back to your original starting point. So your relative strength is similar to your Portland cement without limestone. And part of the reason is, is likely because of this change in porosity. Uh, and this jives with uh, a significant amount of experience in Europe in producing Portland limestone cements. You can um, have perfectly acceptable properties with higher amounts. But one of the goals of our uh, program here was to allow the sustainability benefits of use important limestone cements to be achieved by actually having the materials used in concrete. So we're looking for 
uh, specification for materials with very similar performance properties to the cements that concrete producers are already used to using. Uh, and so, although we recommend doing trial batching, of course, as you would with any new material, to assure yourselves that the performance is what you're expecting, we anticipate that there will be relatively few changes to most uh, mixed designs that concrete producers and specifiers and architects are used to using. And then just briefly, I mentioned this is a proven technology, and it's been used in, in uh, quite a bit in Europe, uh, beginning as far back as 1965 when uh, German standards allowed it for specialty applications with limestone contents up to about 20%. Uh, French standards uh, included provisions for limestone cements in 1979, and Germany for more routine use in 1990, uh, Britain in 92, and then in 2000, EM197 was adopted, which allowed all, uh, I'll say more or less, all European Union countries to uh, use and have a specification for important limestone cements. Very quickly thereafter, um, Important limestone cements um, jumped in usage from, I believe, about 20% to about uh, 33 or 35% of the cement that's, that's used in Europe uh, year in and year out. So there's a lot of concrete in place in the field in Europe made with Portland limestone cements. And then Canada in 2008, and then uh, the U.S. last year in 2012. So I guess as a... As a Overall summary, Portland limestone cements are relatively new to the U.S. Um, cement type, although Brooke and Todd will correct me a little bit there when they speak in a few minutes. Uh, we have between 5 and 15 percent limestone as the uh, specification requirements. The performance is very similar to existing cement types, and there are some significant environmental benefits for using Portland limestone cements. Uh, we do have several uh, literature review uh, type publications. If you're interested in more information, feel free to send me an email and I can get these uh, documents to you. I'll um, also be able to uh, try to address any questions you might have if we don't get time to answer them today. With that, thanks, and uh, I think I have a few moments for questions. Well, we do have five minutes if there are any questions. Jim? Could you comment, you, you mentioned about that you, uh, you, you don't have a moderate or high sulfate resistant limestone cement. Could you comment on the current sort of state of knowledge of sulfate resistance and the limestone cements and you seem to indicate that maybe in the future you might have something that might be more sulfate resistant? Yeah, I think the, the current thinking in CSA and some Canadian researchers are leading the way right now on this. Um, there's a I'll call it a theoretical concern because I don't know that it's ever been really demonstrated. But there's a theoretical concern that uh, Portland limestone cements might somehow be more susceptible to Thomasite sulfate attack because they're a carbonate, a calcium carbonate. And carbonate is, is part of the um, mineralogy of Thomasite. Um, the research that, that started in Canada, and there's some in the U.S. going on now as well, basically indicates that there's a, a performance test, and it's, it's actually sort of in the, it's in the CSA A3000 specs now, but a performance test to uh, test mortars similar to a C1012 test, but at colder temperatures, and to actually extend it out to a longer time frame. So that it's, it, the current thinking is that there's some sort of performance test to make sure that um, lime, corn limestone cements do uh, exhibit sulfate resistance before we'll allow them in the specification. Um, how long that'll take and how long to that research is, is sufficient, um, you can't say. But that's, that's the current thinking. Eventually we expect to have some sort of performance test in the specs. Yes? Uh, good morning. Can you comment on whether there's been any work done on the uh, performance of PLC in the seawater exposure, which is technically a moderate sulfate exposure? I guess I don't know of any that's coming to mind explicitly. I can check through the literature reviews to see what we might have, but um, you can give me your card. I'll try to contact you afterward. None's coming to mind. I don't know if any of the other researchers or speakers are familiar with that. 
What's the lowest latitude homicide has ever been found in North America, other than in a laboratory? Well, I think to be honest, I'll have to say California uh, somewhere, but my understanding was that was a concrete to which uh, a significant amount of gypsum had been added separately. And so that wasn't a, a real cement issue. Um, I have heard of some cases. I think Doug Hooten knows of a couple cases in very far north in Canada. Um, but this was long before Portland limestone cements had been used in Canada. It was you know, straight Portland cement. Um, so I don't know that there are a lot of documented cases of, of tomicide being found in nature in the U.S. or North America. Thank you, Paul. We may have the opportunity to ask some other questions uh, at the end. Um, thank you for your time, Paul. Thanks.